All right, welcome back. In this video today, we're going to talk more about lines and linear functions, but we're going to just, you know, kind of take it up a step and maybe talk about, you know, some meanings of some of these things when they have context attached to them. All right, now first let's talk about parallel lines and perpendicular lines, right? Um, you remember from geometry, two parallel lines, they never in intersect, right? And so if I was to try to draw two parallel lines right here, and I thought about the slopes of these, I'd see that they've kind of got the same inclination, and so I would say it has the same slope. So I would say two lines are parallel if their slopes are equal. Okay. And then two lines are going to be perpendicular if their slopes, you know, maybe in Algebra 1 you said are negative reciprocals of each other. I think a nice condition is if we take the slopes and we multiply them together, they need to be equal to negative 1 for it to be perpendicular, or for the lines to be perpendicular to one another. So if their slopes multiply to negative 1. Okay. And then this would, you know, you remember what perpendicular lines look like from geometry. I hope I do this right. That looks more or less perpendicular. Uh, they intersect at a 90 degree angle, right? Okay. Actually, before I go on, I think I might, you know, do a quick example of two lines that are perpendicular, just for the sake of it. Okay, I'm going to move this up to about there. And I'll say, for example, just a quick example. If we had y equals, let's say, 2 sevenths x plus 1, and well, we wondered what would be the slope of a line that was perpendicular to it. We would take it, if it's a fraction, we'd flip it and make it negative, okay? If it's not already a fraction, like say the slope is four, was the question I got today. If the slope is four, you turn it into a fraction, you call it four over one, then you flip and then you make it negative, right? So we're gonna flip the fraction, we're gonna make it negative. So y equals two sevenths x plus one uh -huh. is perpendicular uh -huh to some line where we flip the slope, so it would be 7 over 2, and we make it negative. And that's our slope, really plus any number, I could say, you know, minus 11 or something, doesn't matter. Okay, these two lines are perpendicular to each other because if I look at their slopes, and I multiply them, okay, then I'd have 2 sevenths multiplied by negative 7 over 2 is equal to negative 14 over positive 14, which is negative 1. Okay, and so that's why we see that. All right, let's do an example now. So let's start with just, just a pretty standard question, right? An equation for a line that passes through the point 3, negative 5. You can't see that. You can probably see it better on your copy and is parallel to the line defined by the equation 2x plus 3y equals 1. What they're really doing here is they're giving us a point and they're giving us a slope. But the slope is just encoded a little bit, right? Parallel to this line, that's just a fancy way of telling us the slope. Okay. Now if you already have a formula ready to go pull this extract the slope out of ax plus by equals c, you go ahead and use that. Okay, if you don't, yeah, you could try to figure one out, or you could just do what I'm about to do and just solve for y each time because it's not that big of a deal. So I'm going to start over here with 2x plus 3y equals 1. And then I'm going to subtract 2x from both sides. So I'll lose the 2x over on the left side, and I will gain a negative 2x on the right side, right? Because there's nothing I can do with negative 2x plus 1. Oh, pardon me. Okay, now I'm going to divide both sides of this equation by 3, right? And if I'm going to be fair, I have to divide everything by 3, the negative 2x and the plus 1. So I'm going to say now that y is equal to negative 2 thirds of x plus 1 third. Now, we only really care about the slope because this is a line that's parallel to the line that we're going to hopefully write an equation for. But I think I might just, you know, kind of highlight that and emphasize that, okay, parallel to this line means it's going to have the same slope, so the slope is going to be negative two-thirds. And if I've got a point and a slope, I'm ready to write an equation using point-slope form. Okay, so I'm going to just kind of be really explicit here. The point is three and negative five. The slope is negative 
2 thirds. So the equation is going to be y minus the y coordinate of the point I know is on the graph. So y minus negative 5 equals the slope multiplied by x minus the x coordinate of the point I know is on the line. Okay, And it just said an equation, write an equation. It didn't say that it needed to be in slope intercept or any sort of special form. So we are going to do that. Now, if you have another way of finding a perpendicular, I mean, pardon me, a parallel line to this that passes through 3, negative 5, and it's a little easier than this, then good for you. Um, if you're interested, then maybe you should come talk to me about it. Because there's, there's also another way that you would get another, you would get a second standard form equation, and it would be pretty easy. But I think this is the most natural way to do it, especially with the level you're at right now. Now let's work one where we're going to find the value of a that makes the lines perpendicular. Okay, so I know that I'm going to start with with line one. Okay, I'm going to solve for y on line one. Okay, I'm going to just subtract four x from both sides, and this will be you know pretty easy to solve for. Okay. Now I know that the slope of line one is negative four. And I also know that L1 and L2 are supposed to be perpendicular. So I would say as a result, I know that that means that L2 has to have slope, what would that be, positive 1 over 4. Not have, that would be L2 has slope positive 1 divided by 4. Now I can go over here and I can solve for y on line 2. Okay, on line 2, I'm going to subtract ax from both sides. Negative ax plus 2. I think I said it wrong. I need to subtract ax from both sides, not 2. Okay, now I'm going to divide both sides by 2. Oh, yeah, I just copied it wrong. It's 2y. That's why it looked wrong. About this did not look right. Okay, yeah, now we're back on track and we're going to divide both sides by 2. Okay. Now, since a times or negative a times x is just a number, we only need to divide it by 2 once. We don't need to divide it by 2 twice. That would be like dividing by 4. And then we're going to say 2 divided by 2, that's 1. All right. Now, what I'm seeing is that if L2 needs to have slope 1 fourth, and the slope of L2 is also negative A over 2, I'm going to just set these two things equal to each other. Okay, and this is the type of solving, or a type of solving that we haven't done yet in this class, but I do need you to be able to, to execute. So I got 1 fourth is equal to negative A divided by 2. Okay? And at this point, we can cross multiply, right? And what I mean by that is we can multiply across the equal sign kind of diagonally. And so I would get negative 4a from that multiplication. And then multiply that way. And I would get 2 times 1. And those are going to be 2. Okay. If you don't like cross multiplication or you're not familiar with it or comfortable with it, well, I would look for, you know, maybe thinking about what would happen if I multiplied both sides by 4. Or multiplied both sides by negative 2. Right? There's all sorts of ways that we can solve that equation, but I think that probably with the people in my class at least, what they're going to be first inclined to do is try to hit that with some cross multiplication. So I'm going to divide both sides by negative 4 now, and I'm going to get a is the same as 2 over negative 4, which is negative 1 half. Okay. And that would be the value of a that makes the lines perpendicular. All right, now let's talk about some horizontal and vertical lines. That's something we haven't talked about yet in this class. We've talked about a lot of lines. So let's start with the y-axis. Let's write an equation for the set of all points on the y-axis. Oh, it's not very good. Okay. And let's just think to ourselves, you know, what do all of these points have in common? Okay. And if you see it, then you see it. You know, skip ahead a few seconds. If you don't see it, well, let's just label some points. Maybe this is the point where x, where, where I don't know, y is equal to 3, but x is equal to 0. Okay. 
and then maybe this is the origin, right? Definitely, not maybe, definitely that's the origin. And then maybe I go down here and maybe that's the point where x is zero and y is negative one. And then you can see, oh, what's common to all three of these points? They're x coordinate, it's always zero. So the y axis is the set of all points where x is equal to zero. Okay. Now I might come back through, oh goodness, that was, did not go how I'd hoped come back through and write an equation for the line that goes through the point 3 and 2, which I'm going to say happens to be right there, and is parallel to the y-axis, which is to say it's vertical. Okay, so I'm just going to draw that line that's uh, oh, hopefully close to parallel to the y-axis, close enough. And if I think about, okay, 3, 2, and then this would also be a point. Well, the x coordinate would not have shifted because I didn't go side to side, I just went up and down. So I'd have the same x and a y of 0. Okay. And what I can see now is that this is going to be the set of all points where x is equal to 3. And now we can do the same thing about the x-axis, right? Okay, so I can go through here, I can kind of color on the x-axis. I don't, I don't think I need to be as detailed with this because the same considerations, right? Think about what do all these points have in common? Their y-coordinate, their y-coordinate is zero. Okay, so the equation for the points on the x-axis, or the line that's represented by the x-axis, that's the line y equals zero. Okay. And then again with this point three and two, and parallel to the x-axis. Uh oh, that's not great. And, and that, that'll be good enough. And if I go over here, I think I've moved side to side. I haven't gone up or down, so the y coordinate's not gonna change. That's gonna be the point where x is zero and y is still two. And as a result, I'll say that the equation that passes through 3, 2 and is horizontal is y equals 2. Now, what you hopefully noticed, you know, when we we're doing this, is that we're going to get a horizontal line with an equation that's like y equals some number. And in the same way, we're going to get a vertical line anytime we take we have an equation x equals a number. And so I think at this point, that's, that's probably what I need you to know about horizontal and vertical lines. I think I've got a couple more examples that I'll show you about that I don't know, might throw some more light on the scenario, but I, I think that'll be good for now. We'll just check back in with our two points defining a unique line example that we've done a few times so far. Okay, we're going to write an equation for the line that contains the points 2, 3, and 2, negative 5. And maybe something about this is catching your eye, but if it's not, just keep going the same way we usually do. I'm going to start by maybe investigating the slope of this thing. Okay. So I'm going to say that the slope is equal to y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. And that slope is looking like negative 8 divided by 0. And we know that division by 0 is bad news, right? If we get a number divided by 0, there's, there's nothing we can do about it. We're not going to be able to do anything in this class or in pre-calculus or calculus or any class, right? And it's Game over. Okay. So it has an undefined slope. And you might remember from algebra 1 that undefined slope actually means vertical. But I'd like if you were like, ah, oh, undefined algebraically, it's not going so well, maybe I could draw a picture. I'd like for you to get to that point where you feel like you can draw a picture and use that to help you figure stuff out. Okay, 2 and 3, maybe that's there. 2 and negative 5, that's going to have the same x coordinates, so it's got to be right above. And look, that's a vertical line. It's going to be the set of all points where x is equal to 2. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk to you today about is interpreting the meaning of some of these things. So I'm going to real quick remind you of the definition of slope, which is rise over run. It's y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Okay? That doesn't give us a whole lot of meaning, right, in terms of the context of the question. Okay, what the meaning is, is it's like the rate of change of y with respect to x, but we're just going to call it a rate of change for now. And even just thinking about, oh, what's the rate of change of, you know, whatever y represents, 
that it doesn't always lead you exactly to the right answer, you know, or it's not doesn't make it super obvious. One thing that I've found has helped people is thinking about it in terms of the units of the slope, especially when our, all of our stuff is linear. So what you need to know, you know, slope is a change in y divided by a change in x. And x and y might have their own units, right? X might be measured in time and y might be measured in population or something. And so the units for slope are going to be the units of y divided by the units of x, just like rise over run. You can also say, you know, to not write as a fraction, you can write it out in words, units of y per units of x. And that might be something I go do in this next example here. All right, so this example I got for you, I pulled from one of my practice AP calculus exams. This is an actual AP calculus question. I just changed the, uh, I added the word linear and I changed something to the word slope to make it more obvious for y'all. But otherwise, it's the exact same question. And on a certain day, the number of candies produced by a factory is modeled by C, which is like Y, okay, that's the output. And it's a function of T, which is like X, it's gonna be the input. And C is measured in pieces of candy, and T is measured in hours. So I'm gonna actually start with the slope before I go to the meaning, All right? Okay, units of the slope Remember, that's units of output divided by units of input, units of y divided by units of x. It's going to be units of c divided by units of t. So it's going to be c is measured in a number of candies divided by t is measured in hours. Okay. So you could look at it at candies divided by hour. If that's not really setting it off for you, we can call that candies per hour. Okay. And that should give you a better idea that this is the rate that we're producing candy at, right? Pieces per hour. Okay, so the meaning is it's going to be the rate of candy production. But if you're not, you know, just looking to interpret, you want to take the terminology from what you're given, you don't want to think too hard, There it is, right? We can just copy the terminology they use. Rate of candy produced by a factory. Okay. And that's the meaning. I'm not sure what's going on there. You don't need to worry about any limits, right? This is an algebra class thing. I've flipped over to a different window. All oh, right, but that's uh, that's all for you know interpreting slope. You just need to see a few of these, you know, see all the different situations, and then you'll be fine. Now, the last thing I got for you is interpreting the x and the y intercepts, and well, I don't, I'm not sure how that's going to go. First, I need to remind you of the definition of the x-intercept. Right, the x-intercept that's the point where y is equal to zero. And the y-intercept, that's going to be the place where x equals 0. Okay. Now, the meaning of the intercepts, the y-intercept, that can be kind of, that's where we plug in 0, or 0 for the independent variable. Especially if the independent variable is time, it's going to be kind of like a starting value. Now, it might not be exactly where the thing started, but maybe it started where, where you started paying attention but it's some kind of a starting value. And so, I'm gonna say that that's something like a starting value. Right? Not necessarily exactly that, but some kind of initial, initial value. And then the x-intercept doesn't always have meaning, right? There's going to be some scenarios where the x-intercept is negative and that doesn't actually make any sense, right? And that's okay. I won't ask you to interpret an x-intercept whose meaning doesn't make any sense. Okay? But sometimes it could be, you know, if something's running out, or if something's draining, which I think is a scenario C on the homework or the quiz or something. Well, if something's draining and x measures time and y measures how much water is still in the container that's draining, well, the x-intercept would be when all the water ran out. 
shape. So that's just one scenario. I've got a couple down here, for, for example, that we can look at. Um, that'll be a little more concrete. Oh, yeah, this this example, I remember this one from this morning. I, I must have copied it down wrong, uh, or maybe I changed it to, you know, X is measured in feet and not miles. I think that was probably it. And so I'm gonna be changing this. I don't know if this is realistic, but I'm gonna just change it to minus 0 0.3600x. Because the way it is, the slope would mean that for each increase of one foot above sea level, you're gonna decrease by 3600 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I don't think that's realistic, right? Okay, so there must've been something wrong with when I copied this equation. Okay, so suppose Y represents the temperature of the air in degrees Fahrenheit at altitude X. Okay. What's the meaning of the y-intercept? Well, first we can find it. That's going to be where x equals 0. And so y will equal 68 minus 0, and then just be 68. Okay. The meaning is that the temperature at the ground level is 68 degrees. And now the x-intercept, we'll see if this is actually realistic. Okay, this is the point where y is equal to 0. And so I'm going to say, all right, well, I can just set y equals 0 and solve this equation. 0 equals 68x. Nope, not x. 68 minus 0.36x. Yeah, that's probably good that we practice solving one of these with decimals. It's been a few days, right? So let's try to solve this thing. Let's subtract 68 from both sides. So negative 68 equals negative 0.36x. I'm realizing that... Uh, this is not this is not going to be a realistic model, the 0.36. That's, I don't know, something went horribly wrong there. And so I need to solve for x by dividing by negative 0.36, and I'm going to get x equals 188.889 feet. Okay. Now, what this means is that at an altitude of evidently 189 feet, we're expecting a temperature of zero. Okay. That means, that's telling me that there's something wrong, right? Because 180 feet in the air, you know, in lots of cities, there's a difference between, uh, in between like the top of the highest hill and lowest point in the city, far more than that. And we're not dealing with, you know, 68 degrees to zero degrees there, right? That's not realistic, okay? I'm going to say height, the meaning is the height where we expect zero degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, and that's all I got for you for this video. I think you should, you know, practice all these situations, you know, generously, but that's all. Thanks for watching.